about the shared house she is going to move into. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 7. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully to the first part of the conversation and answer questions 1 to 7. Hello? Hello, this is Hilary. I'm calling about the house. I'm moving in next week. Oh yes, Hilary. This is Judith. I met you when you came to look at the house. Yes. I just had a few more questions I wanted to ask. Of course. Well, first, about the rent. I realise I didn't check what it included. Yes, that's important. It includes most things. We don't have to pay extra for heating, for example, just for the telephone, which is fair enough, I suppose. Local taxes are part of the rent, so that's not a worry. That's fine. Then I remember I should have sent my letter of reference to the landlord by now, but I haven't got his address. Yes, you should get that off right away. Address it to Mr Crawley. He's at 14 King Street. Is that in Exford? Yes. And then you'll need to put the postcode, of course. It's AP12... Mm-hmm. 7QT. Got that. Thanks. I also realise I don't know exactly what the house has in the way of equipment. Is there a microwave, for example? There isn't. None of us feels the need. Oh, fine. I'm sure I can do without one, too. What about a hairdryer? Maybe you should bring one, if you need one. I'll buy one, yes. And TV? Oh, yes. We've got two, in fact. Was there anything else? I just wondered if there were any rules. Not really. We share the cleaning, things like that. We do have to be careful about loud music. Yes. So we've agreed that there shouldn't be any loud music after nine and that we don't play music at all in the living room after ten. Up to eleven in your own room's OK, as long as it's not too noisy. That sounds good. And is there somewhere safe I can keep my bike? That's difficult. To be honest... Lots do get stolen round here. We haven't got a garage, so we tend to park ours in the garden so that they're hidden from the street. OK. Now, I hope you like cooking. Yes, I do. Do you all have shared meals? Not very often, actually. But when the weather's good in the summer, we like to have a barbecue together, which we do each Wednesday. We tend to go out at weekends. Sounds fun. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 8 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 8 to 10. Are you familiar with this area? A bit. Actually, there are a few things that I'd like to know the location of. A bank, for example. Yes, there's one quite close. You just go up to the junction near the house, the one where four roads meet, and go straight ahead and then take the second left. It's a little way down there on the left-hand side. That's convenient. Another thing is that I'd like to check my emails quite often. I was wondering how far away an internet cafe was. Well, there are a couple, actually, but one's much cheaper than the other. The one I use is very handy. You just go up to the big junction and then... Well, I go straight ahead and then turn right so that it's on the right-hand side. Fine. And one last thing. Uh-huh. I need to go to the post office quite often. I'm hoping there's one quite close to the house. You're in luck. You'd walk up to the big junction and then, if you want a nice route, take the street that's slightly to the right. 
Then you'd want the second left, and you'd find it on the right side of the street. Well, it all sounds great. So, we'll see you in a couple of days' time. Yes. Okay. Bye. Bye. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. You are going to hear a talk about making the most of graduate school. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 16. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 16. Entrance to the graduate school. My job now is to give you the graduate school survival guide and make some concise suggestions for getting the most out of your relationship with our research supervisor, getting the most out of what you read, and making continual progress with your research. First, your relationship with your supervisor. This is fundamental. Meet regularly. You should expect to meet once a week or at least every other week because this will give you the motivation to make progress and also keeps your advisor aware of your work. Prepare for your meetings. Come to each meeting. Also, bring the notes from your previous meeting together with a list of any upcoming deadlines. Make a plan for what you hope to get out of each meeting. After the meeting, email your supervisor a brief summary. Include a list of major topics discussed, a list of what you agreed on, a note of any advice you may not want to follow, and a new summary of what you are planning to do. This helps avoid misunderstandings and provides a handy record of the progress of your research. Add a to-do list for yourself and your supervisor, including a reading list. Finally, add the time and date for the next meeting. My second main piece of advice is to keep your supervisor informed. Show him or her the results of your work as soon as possible. This helps your supervisor understand your research and identify any potential points of conflict early in the process. Include summaries of your work, including any results of experiments, and also anything you write about your research. Thirdly, communicate clearly. If you disagree with your advisor, state your objections and concerns clearly and calmly. If you feel that something about your relationship is not working, discuss it with him or her. Whenever possible, suggest steps that they could take to address your concerns. Under this heading, it is extremely important to take the initiative. You do not need to clear everything you do in your research with your advisor. He or she is busy too. You must be responsible for your own ideas and the progress of your work. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 17 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 17 to 20. 
The second section of my talk is about getting the most out of what you read. The first principle here is to be organized. Keep an electronic bibliography with notes and pointers to the paper files. Keep and file all the papers you have read. Point two, be efficient. Only read what you need to. Start by reading only the conclusion, scanning figures and tables, and looking at their references. Read the other sections only if the paper seems relevant or you think it might help you get a different perspective. Skip the sections you think you already understand. These are often the background and motivation sections. It's of critical importance to take good notes on every paper you find worth reading. Note especially what problem the author is trying to solve, what approach they take to the problem, and how their approach differs from other approaches. Next, summarize what you have read on each topic. After you have read several papers on the same topic, note the key problems, the various formulations of the problem under consideration, the relationship between the various approaches and the alternative approaches you come across. Let me add one point you might not have already thought of. Read PhD theses. Even though they are long, they can be very helpful for quickly learning about what has been done in your field of interest. Focus particularly on the background sections and method sections. Don't forget to read your advisor's thesis. This will give you an idea of what he or she expects from you. The third section of my talk is about making continual progress with your research. Keep a journal of your ideas. Write down every issue you are thinking about, even if you think it is stupid. This will help you keep track of your progress and keep you from going round in circles. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You will now listen to a talk on bicycles. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Today, we're going to talk about the latest bikes for professionals and novices. There's something to suit everyone from price to function. The Atlantis is a touring frame. It's also perfect for commuting and trail riding, and anything short of super-fast road riding. The tubes are stout, to take touring loads and trail abuses. The tyre clearances are majestic, so you can fit tyres up to 2.35 inches. It's designed for cantilevers or V-brakes. If you have to limit yourself to just one bike and you want to be able to ride just about anywhere, this is the bike to be on. It is our most popular model for just that reason, and there isn't an unhappy Atlantis owner in the land. The Rambouille, our all-around road bike, is available either as a frame with fork and headset for $1,400 or as a complete bike for $2,300. Compared to the Atlantis, it is a lighter frame, not intended for loaded touring or rough trail riding. As a road bike, it has side pull brakes. The Quick Beam is our version of the single-speed bike. We've done it a little better, though. 
The crankset has a 4234 combination, running an 18 toothed freewheel cog in the rear. And the rear hub is threaded opposite the drive side, so you can install a fixed cog of your own choice. In essence, you can have four speeds on the quick beam if you choose. The quick beam is available as a frame with fork and headset for $900 or as a complete bike for $1,300. This is a rugged, versatile bike that you can ride on the road as well as on rough trail. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. The Saluki is our roadish, light touring, randonneuring frame. It's designed for 650B wheels. If 650B means anything to you, you'll either love it or think it's marketing suicide. If you're new to 650B and a follower, you won't want it. If you're new and a rebel, you will. Now, I'll just talk a little about saddle comfort. The road bike, for the most part, has turned into a high-tech, uncomfortable machine, and the proof is all around us. Look through any bike magazine or catalogue, and you'll see the saddle up to six inches higher than the handlebars. It is impossible to be comfortable on such a bike. It forces you to lean forward, putting more weight on your groin, hands and arms. People ride these bikes with straight, locked-out arms and wake up with aching backs. They endure it, get used to it, or buy recumbents. When we custom design a bike for you, you'll be able to get a comfortable position. Your back will be between 45 and 50 degrees, and there will be a noticeable bend in the arms. And most importantly, your arms won't be supporting your body weight. You won't have to look up to look ahead because you won't be hunched over and low. That means our bikes are more accessible for riding on the flats, or even for short climbs. We consider this when we design and build your custom frame. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. You are going to hear a conversation between two students about studying abroad. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Hey Mary, how's school going? Haven't seen you in a while. What have you been up to? John, good to see you again. I've been really busy the last couple of weeks. I'm applying to study abroad next year. Really? So am I. I think it will be a great experience to be able to study in another country. What country do you want to go to? At first I wanted to study in Africa, but my parents really don't want me to go there because they think it will be dangerous. So now I'm thinking about going to Spain, Italy or Japan. Actually, I think Africa would be a fascinating place. 
I would want to go there to visit. Maybe not to study, but definitely I would want to go visit. For next year, I want to go to either China or Germany to study, but my parents can't afford any European countries, so maybe. Why China or Germany? Well, I want to go to China because I think it's a really interesting country with a long history. Plus, it has been changing so much, and I think it is a great time to be there. I really want to improve my Chinese also, and I've been taking Mandarin courses the last two semesters. I would want to go to Germany because my mother is German, and I want to learn more about my cultural background. How about you? Why the countries you chose? Well, I want to go to a Spanish-speaking country. I took Spanish in high school, so I figure if I go to a Spanish-speaking country, I'll be better off knowing some of the language already. But I have already been to Mexico many times, and South American countries don't have classes for my major, except for Brazil. But they mostly speak Portuguese there. I would want to go to Italy because I want to do a study about ancient Roman civilization. It has always been a dream of mine to go and see Pompeii and the volcanic ruins. Plus, my family has Italian roots, and I love Italian food. I want to go to Japan mainly because my girlfriend was born in Japan and always tells me all of these fascinating stories about Japanese history and culture. I am a big fan of sumo wrestling, also, so I've always wanted to see a sumo match in person. I really love sushi and almost all Japanese food. Recently, I have started to watch some Japanese baseball too, but of course, these are all secondary reasons. My main reason is, of course, my girlfriend and understanding her culture. I don't speak any Japanese though, so that is my major drawback. I think it is much better to go to a country if you can speak the language. That's great. When do you have to decide by? I have to finish all my applications this week. I'm really stressed trying to finish everything on top of all my schoolwork. I'm almost done with my applications. I just have to finish the Italy application. I think my last choice is Italy, so I'm doing that one last. How long do you want to go for? I think I'm only going to go abroad for one semester, or else I won't be able to graduate on time. I have many classes left until I can finish my degree, and I'm not sure if I will be able to take them studying out of the country. I think I might be able to study in Spain because my Spanish is fluent, but definitely not in Italy or Japan, unless they have classes offered in English. I want to go for a year. I've heard that it's better to go for a year because you get a full experience and get a better grasp on the language. But I understand that most people can't finish their degree in time. It was hard trying to decide which country I would rather go to, but I think my first choice is to go to China. I know Germany will be great, also. Either way, I will be thrilled to have the opportunity to study there. What's your first choice? I really don't have one. Actually, I think I'm like you. Just being able to study in another country will be great. Either Japan or Spain will be awesome. Italy will be awesome too. But I've been there a bunch of times, so I think I prefer to go somewhere else. Sounds exciting. We'll have to go to class now. It was great talking to you again. See you around next time. Yeah, sure. See you around. Hope that everything goes well. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute. To check your answers.